know how much data is changing the media buying and advertising industry and to discuss some really gritty and interesting questions about how it's affecting our lives and the future of programmatic. Um, I'm delighted to welcome a fantastic panel of you know, real pioneering technologists who have founded companies who are at the cutting edge of the programmatic revolution in our industry. To introduce them and to host what is going to be a fascinating panel discussion, um, please give a warm round of applause for our resident maverick at the Festival of Media, Mr. Mark Palmer. Good afternoon. Can you all hear us? I know people couldn't hear in the back. We're, we're, we've all been told to be like an American earlier and speak loud, which, is, which we'll come on to in a moment. Um, the, the brief is um, quite interesting in that there's a lot of talk about things like transparency and data and all the other stuff on it. And we've got a group of people who are going to try and be independently neutral and be grown up, almost like it's a private conversation they're having with the client, bearing in mind everybody's in the room to overhear it. So we're going to try and have a common sense conversation about that. So, let me start. Um, we're going to sort of try and touch on a couple of subjects. Thank you. Um, and we'll go through it. Let me do the first one. Um, if we imagine uh, you're with a brand, and so it's all from the talk from the brand perspective, and you're telling them why uh, programmatic is important, what would you say to them to get them to do something about it? As opposed to, you know, because there's a lot of talk about it and I should do it. If you had to say something to them to say, look, wake up, don't wait, do something, what would you say? What would you say? I'd say absolutely try it because uh, there's, there's a massive transformation happening in how digital media is bought. And, uh, you know, Ricardo from Roma would, would be able to target a client like Weight Watchers but not think of that. But programmatic media actually would give them an insight that, for instance, they, you know, there's a lot more uh, ROI in targeting Weight Watchers because it performs a lot better on Man U, Arsenal, and Chelsea. Uh, it wouldn't be your first thinking, but that, that comes through through the data and actually understanding that actually it's blokes sitting there watching you know football scores that are actually buying that online, and that's not what the client would think from the outset. Okay, what, so what, you know the old machine is someone does a buy, they talks about the plan, they've got the commercially why you know because the simple answer was always it's going to save you money, you're going to re reduce your staff costs, it's going to be ops efficient, the world's too complicated for you to do it on your own but yet people still don't. So the logic seems quite compelling. You've heard Dominic earlier say, we're going to do that. Steve King said that. So <clears throat> what's the reason? Yeah, so I mean, look, I think brands, the, the, the problem they're trying to solve for remains driving awareness and moving product sales. And, so, and they're trying to do that in an increasingly competitive environment. Um, and if you were to say to them, look, you're, you know, a tweak in technology or embracing a new technology is going to allow you to fundamentally change the trajectory of your, your brand and your sales, I think the answer would be yes. And, and I think the opinion of probably everyone on the panel is that programmatic is such a technology that will fundamentally change uh, how brands um, connect and use data in an informed way. So, um, you know, from my perspective, and I think it's interesting as well, you know, we think, about, we think about programmatic in the construct of anything that is not manual, and so it's automated. And I think if a brand, which, and brands are increasingly becoming media owners themselves, and they're collecting enormous amounts of data, and they're creating a ton of content, distributing that content. And so uh, from the perspective of, do you want to miss that boat and not, not embrace uh, an automated mechanism that allows you to utilize that data in a really effective way? Uh, you know, my view is that if you're not doing it, you're going to be you're going to be left behind in this uh, incredibly competitive environment. Right, but, but that's but that's what everybody always says. So yeah. I, you know, I don't think we like the mobile chart about how much mobile. You can go back to 1999, and someone said it was the year of mobile. And you can put the, the argument for mobile is we spend so much time on mobile, it must be. Yeah, I spend as much time sleeping, and that's not a monetary system. <laughs> <laughs> so rather than giving me it must be and the future is going to happen, give me some hard numbers well, or some I'll hard facts that gets a client to go shit. <laughs> Sorry, so that translate some. for people? So we, we have a, um, a, you know, a major U.S. packaged goods company who's pulled down their total costs and increased their output of the marketing about 25%. So that's over a large sum of money. I mean, it's not nine figures, but it's, it's eight. Um, and, and those kinds of you know, efficiency improvements of 25% are <clears throat> fairly common. So I think efficiency in the sort of parlance of media, yeah. i.e. cost savings, is sort of a jumping off point. 
But I think there's a lot more here, as, as these guys are alluding to, than, than just cost savings. But I think that's a reason why, to start tomorrow, you're just reducing waste. I mean, I'll put it in the most sort of pejorative, you know, yeah. I can. Just, just there's a lot of advertising waste. Um, both this, it sort of evaporates between the middlemen, you know, somewhere in the chain between the marketer and the publisher. That's one kind of waste. And the second is just advertising that just doesn't work and that when you learn it's not working, you should just stop doing. I think it's PwC who uh, estimates that the $500 billion per year in advertising will decline to something more like you know, $375 billion um, as the whole industry gets more efficient. And, and <clears throat> that's how I feel. I mean, people should be spending more money making a better product and uh, less money wasted on advertising. So Brent, when we talk about programmatic, we talk, we're not talking just real time, are we? So that's what everybody often assumes, because we're not just talking about real time bidding. And we're talking about, as we go forward, we're talking about television, we're talking about anything. How big yeah. is the market? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, well, I think it's a, it's a if you look at digital today, it's widely considered 20, maybe a $30 billion industry. In five to 10 years, if you presume this is all delivered over internet protocol, that's a $200 billion industry. And the complexity across device and targeting, programmatic will, will have to happen. But it's not a big, scary word. Oftentimes, I stop and just say, what does programmatic mean? And to us, it's simple. It's using technology to improve process and data to improve results. Yeah. That's it. That's hard to argue with. But one, you, you say you want to factor a data point. One thing we look in terms of where's the market going is in the United States, what do college kids buy that, 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 or choose not to buy once they leave, you know, because that's, that's where you realize when you've got to actually pay your own bills, what am I willing to fork over for? 85% of college students today don't buy cable when they, when they leave and go out on their own. Don't do it. So in a world without cable, without television, you can see what's coming. That is the media universe, and it will be not impossible, but it will have enough complexity where technology and data plays a critical role. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at, at what Steve King presented earlier, you know, the market rate now, 503 billion global ad spend. Of that, 12 billion was programmatic, about 4%. Industry experts are saying it's going to be 80% within 10 years. That's a massive transformation. It's similar to what the NASDAQ did to stock trading back in the 80s. And due to that change, we need to, you know, as a marketer, you need to realize that and realize that it's, it's going across all media. And very few people, as, as Brandon said, are, are, are watching TV anymore. So you need to get with the program where the users are and reach them. And okay, marketers okay. need to find Can I just ways. ask the audience? So, ha, huh, I need to do things like put your hands up here. In your view, if we talk about programmatic where it starts with display, how many believe that ultimately it's going to be the majority of stuff that's done in display within a relatively short period of time, say two, three years? Put your hand up. Okay, it's like the majority. How many people think that also applies to mobile? If we put mobile up, okay, social media, not as many. Okay, now take it five years out. How many thinks it's also going to apply to television? Okay, right, so just wake up. You've all just said in five years' time you're going to have to deal with this. So just probably pay attention now. <laughs> so I'm dozing off. Deal with it. Yeah, deal with it. Deal yeah, with deal it. with it. Just all together now. One, two, three. Deal, deal with, with it. it. Right. <laughs> right. So I'm a brand, right? You're, you're in this neutral thing, private conversation to everybody in the audience. Um, oh I've got first party data. <laughs> yep, that's my data. It could be stuff I've got for my search. I've got um, second party, which is the media owner data that goes into the system. And then I might have third party. It could be driving licenses or medical records or all sorts of other stuff on it. Right. So there's a lots of conversation about who owns the data. Okay, now if I play in the middle, there's obviously client data, but when I put it into a system, there's a bit of everything, isn't there? There's my data, plus the media owner's data, plus whatever data you've got. So if you would talk to a client and you were advising them as a person outside, what do they do when it comes to the question of who should own the data or what they should do to protect themselves in that market? Because everybody's scared of it, but no one seems to do that. Well, I'm, we have this conversation all the time. The first thing we say is stop running 18 ad networks on your site all of whom have a pixel up in your site and are basically trading your data as part of their business model. Um, I, I mean, start there. Uh, there's huge amounts of data leakage when you have that many third parties um, sort of sitting on your web assets pulling in the data. Um, so that's where I would start. Um, secondly, you know, tr try to find a technology and, and partner that you can trust that, that keeps your data in a silo. 
So go, to, let's do the, we're going to come back to the trust. So how do I, as a brand, because brands would like the idea of trust, what is it they physically ask for or require if they were briefing out something to get that trust? Because everybody says, trust me, and I've got this, and my system. So what is it they actually would ask, you know, if it's whoever's going out to bring, what would they ask for? They'd ask, uh, um, are you as a vendor in the business of uh, reselling data, first of all? Second of all, do you, do you keep my data separate, and can you show me how you do that? You know, sort of basically prove it. Um, and, you know, thirdly, thirdly I think, um, you know, does your business model involve, you know, reusing data across clients? And, and there are models that do that, and, and uh, that may, you know, some people may like that. In fact, if you're a small brand, it, maybe it's good for you, because you get the benefit of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would talk more about a scale issue. Uh, you know, Mike, you're mentioning uh, ad networks and not having all those pixels there. A lot, a lot of the uh, big internet titans have consolidated into these huge programmatic exchanges. You know, I have two vendors here we work with, AOP, AppNexus, represent a lot of Microsoft inventory. You have DoubleClick Bid Manager with Google. You have FBX. Uh, which represents a huge amount of, of social media. And what we learned is you need scale. You can't just fish in one ocean. So you need a lot of different platforms to access the entire ecosystem of programmatic media out there. And that does require multiple pixels. That does require clients actually putting, put, asking that data issue. But I would say don't sacrifice scale on a data issue and make sure you vet your partners and make sure that they've so, got so their eyes So just so I explain to people, the reality is you can have lots of ad networks or DSPs. Your mm -hmm. point is if you've just got one or a limited number, then from simple brand terms, you won't get as much reach. Yeah. And therefore, you also might have one. I, see, I disagree. Okay. I disagree with that. Um, <clears throat> you can use one primary you know, data collection uh, mechanism, whether it's a data management platform or, or a DSP. But I think as soon as you start to have a lot of different third parties on your site, um, you lose control of your data. Yeah. And, and so I think the best but practice is... Yeah, but I'm just saying, saying, it's like yeah, I'm, I'm just saying pixels, it. guys, from the big internet titans. I'm not saying necessarily ad networks, but you do need, you need to use those, those uh, resources that you have in terms of fishing the entire, well, all the oceans, not just one. So a lot of people will, will have double-click bid manager and they think they've got their programmatic covered. And the reality is, Double-click bid manager is owned by Google, and you're really going to have good access to Google, but you might not have as great access to AOP, okay, to me, AOL. Right. No, I, th I, th I would agree with both. Actually, it's a bit of an equivocating answer, but I think it's the right one, which is it depends. How important is your customer data to the business you're doing? What types of compromises or understandings do you want to make to increase reach or not? And bucket it, too. So on one end of the data question is data privacy and data security, and that's inviolable. And I think a lot of the concern starts there. I don't think anyone here would compromise those things. It's just a matter of how, like, you're going to collect a lot of data. Do you have the ability to understand it, to use it for targeting or optimization? If not, maybe you're willing to consider a wider range of strategies. Okay, so we'll touch, so one of the things that any brands here, and I'm, I'm not, I used to be at an agency, I'm not a social agency, you have conversation with brands, and I'll have a conversation with you and another brand about this area, we're all discussing it, and what they do with data and what, it, Going back to one of the benefits of being with an agency is actually you've got an advisor. They should hopefully understand your business. And lots of people are very happy because at the end of the day, I've put money in, it's gone into their trading desk, it's generated a return for me. What do I care? Because it's, you know, I'm reporting back to them saying I've got business. Lots of people are very happy. There's a separate conversation which is really starting to escalate about worries about transparency or anything else in it. Just for a moment, can we put some blame on another side of this, which is we have a process here. A client can ask what they want. There was a piece of work that we were talking about. There was an ANA conference in America where 700 people turned up about the whole area of de trading desks. One of the interesting points was of the people there from procurement, bear in mind there's 700 people, only 10 of the people in the room from procurement from the client said, said they understood a trading desk. Is there a separate problem with all this that you guys get it, possibly the agencies get it, but lots of clients are currently basically not dealing with this and just want to go around and around asking the question. And in the middle of all this, we're so busy talking about transparency and issues, we're not waking up to the fact that five years out it's going to be trading anything, and I should do something about it. Is, is, you know, if you go to the clients, would you say any of that, or was it just me being nasty? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I would say from the ANA, we also learned 75% of brands don't really have a handle on this, right? So that's another stat, not just procurement. But I mean, you know, half of those um, 75 are, are doing it in one fashion or another. But the truth is, this 75. is all very confusing. 75% either don't 
know what programmatic is or, or they've heard it, they may be doing it, but they don't really understand it. So how could you expect the procurement team to really understand this? So what should they do? You know, so imagine you've taken a year off as you sold another company or whatever it is, to, and you chat to a client here and say, look, if I was you and you want to get into programmatic, what would be two or three bits of advice from a practical point of view to go, I should do it, but I worry, should I chat to my agency? Should I go and hire somebody internally? What would you say? Yeah, well, look, in Mike's session, uh, just, just ended uh, the past session, um, Ben Jankowski said he was a bit uncomfortable because his agent, agency is acting as a referee and a player. So sticking to the Canadian That's the Rome analogy, example. Yeah, like, you know, Gretzky's, you know, his agent also owns the hockey club he's working for. So he's going to get a great trade deal. So I think you need competition and uh, you need to be able to, because there's such a massive shift of, of everything becoming traded programmatically, you need a lot of partners in it. And the agencies need to orchestrate and marshal the vendors, not be a vendor. But, but I, having worked with clients, I, I, yeah. when a pitch comes up, I might be wrong, they're not asked to do that. They're put up against four other agencies and put your yeah. spend, fill your Xboxes here, yeah. this is your discount, here's your fees, oh, and by the way, can you answer these six questions on the transfer of your trading list? They're not asked, <coughs> what would you do with my data for the business and this is what I wouldn't pay you, and they're not asking you guys probably either as an alternative part to do it. So we're having a, what we're having is potentially a legacy system about prices and discounts when we should be talking about uh, data orientated. Yeah. And, and I think it's, keep in mind procurement is good in particular at helping you buy commodities or things where you can source the value and drive costs down. That's their job. We tend to think of marketing in this form as an operational cost, meaning it drives sales. So if you drive, if you remove this type of spend, you're going to lose sales or lose customer acquisition. That's disastrous for your business. So when you approach it as a revenue driver, it implies a whole other level of skill set, understanding, and what you're willing to pay because it's value driven, not cost driven. Okay. If I, if I talk in terms of you've launched a, 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 at one. You're, it's already out there, you, you've got somebody speaking afterwards who will mention it, where, so you're talking programmatic across all media, but also you're talking about having an open platform. Do you want to explain? So just go through and explain people, because we talk very much about, so this is not just digital, what if it goes across media? So give us yeah, sure. So a couple of weeks ago in, in San Francisco, Matt, who's going to be speaking uh, shortly, and our CEO, Tim, Tim Armstrong, announced the uh, AOL one in, in partnership with IPG. Uh, and I think that's right. I mean, I think you, you've, you've steered away from the transparency word. I think it's important as it relates to the control that a brand has and the data. And so we've consciously gone out and created an e open ecosystem. Now, this is a work in progress. It's to be launched. But the concept is to, it's modular and it allows advertisers and pub publishers to, to plug in. And, they, and they, the brand itself can control the data. We will we'll provide our first party data back to the brand. They can use their own DMP. Um, and at the end of the day, it is meant to be multi-screen for both paid reserve or premium and, uh, and what I think is deemed commonly as remnant. So it's a massively powerful opportunity. I think it was, a, it was an interesting uh, discussion a couple weeks ago because two leaders, Matt and Tim, started to talk about this notion of programmatic back in Can, And obviously Matt's uh, very public with the aspirational sort of 50% shift. And we came together um, and introduced the platform, which I think will have obviously massive, uh, massive impact in terms of the shift and helping accelerate that. Okay. So is that the same? Because all your businesses, all your businesses are looking there for oh, yeah, presumably I mean, mobile, TV. Yeah, you know, it's like welcome to the party. See, that's how you know programmatic is <laughs> yeah, big. Yeah. Even AOL is doing it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Been, oh, it's, it's, sorry. I, I, you know, I'm just trying to keep I, things lively. I would yeah. argue AOL has been doing it for longer than anybody, right? It's been a 20 year process of, I mean, programmatic. He's an American, again, Canadian, you can hit it. That's fair enough. Actually, I thought you might have been Canadian by the introduction, but the, the reality <laughs> He's is, for married 20 to years, a Canadian, my wife. Yeah. Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah. I kid because I care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The reality is, and again, it, it depends on your definition of programmatic. If it's, if it's automated, We've been, we've been automating bidding in the network space for a very long time, and so the evolution as to where we are now and where we're taking one is a really natural one for us. Okay, so let's, yeah. let's do the next bit. So I'm a client. There are a number of clients, we won't mention them, who've decided to do it themselves, yeah. quite very large brands, uh, building capabilities. You could do it with an agency. You could do a mixture of both. Just from, imagine I go further forward. Why would you say, where should a client do it? Should they do it in-house, but working with you guys? I know you've got different models. Should they work through? What's your view? And what's why? Give me, give me reasons why, hard reasons. 
I think it's, it's a hard thing to build the capabilities in-house. There's multiple platforms that you'd have to negotiate with, so we're talking, you know, reasonably 16 potential platforms that are players in the market that you'd have to get commercial deals with. Also, having that expertise, it's a live auction, so if you make a mistake, um, you know, it's a couple hundred thousand dollars the next morning you walk in the office. There is a reason why ad networks and ad serving technologies had a lot of people in their companies because there's, so, there's a lot of work that has to go in to execute these campaigns from pixels to loading up to working different UI softwares into all these guys' different platforms. And I think that's, you know, for, for a client bringing that in-house, it's great to have someone to help facilitate that to a bunch of vendors who can offer you so, a lot of reach. So going back to Dominic's point, Dominic says he's investing in technology and all the people, you know, imagine you're having a conversation which is well the difference is. What's the difference? So he's gonna he knows the brand, he knows the business he's managing the total media. Why would he rather why would a client talk to you rather than you know, just I, let Dominic I, sort it? I actually think the, the agency of record has an enduring role here. I think For Ben sure. put it to be the orchestrator. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's we're turning into a platformized market, you know, whether it's Facebook or Google or AOL or what have you. Um, we're not managing media anymore so much as managing platforms. So I, I think actually we'll see that the AOR has a very, um, it needs to evolve a bit, but it has a very key role, you know, continuing on in orchestrating these things. Yeah. Can you be a, ma a master and an expert of all of these things? No, you're going to have to have partnerships. Um, so I think when it comes to the agency, you know, they're great at marketing services. Um, agencies are not technology companies, and, and if, you know, you wanted to sort of say, well, give me some proof, you know, look at what percentage of Omnicom or WPP's operating expenses is R&D. Right? It's, it's a dash on the PL. It, it, there's no number if you look at their annual expenses, right? Versus the technology companies can be anywhere from 30 to 10% as it matures. So there's very, I think these, these uh, players need each other. Um, the brands are not about to sort of double staff typically to bring in a big, um, uh, you know, operations in house. Although you've, some, you've seen some do it with search. Um, so it does happen, but um, I, I think um, the model going forward is to bring the expertise and to partner with the agency of record I, to get it right for the brand. Here's a question. Can, can, I, can I ask you how many of your staff have stock options, for instance, in data? Service? 100%. There you go, 100%. <laughs> that's, that's what the difference is. We can, you can't attract technologists if you don't have stock options. And that is what is required, I think, in this. And you need vendors, and that's how, because it, it's technological. You need to do server-to-server -server integration with the internet titans. You, you know, and I think that's a key distinction. So, that's a good point. Yeah. I, well, I'd be hard pressed to understand why any brand would want to build the technology. Yeah. That, that seems nuts. Okay. Um, however, there are some companies who choose to staff their own trading desks. I can give you one example. It's a customer of ours, Netflix. Yep. They understand their customer and how important customer acquisition is to their strategy so well that they've got a team and they use our technology in ways we could never match. So, so to that point, it's, it's not having the tech, but you should have the expertise. When you know your customers and what you're trying to do in analytics and you can see holistically across your business what you need to do with your data, then you're in a good position to run your own operation, right? The same is true of Amazon, eBay, companies like that for whom this is critical. But this is the interesting point, because it, it moves away well beyond it's just media. I and mean, you know, Steve King talked earlier about, we used to buy coupons of people going to shops. The Economist had a figure, but within 10 years' time, all third of all shopping in the UK is online. If people are out and about and they're on their mobile, there's a practical reality that everything ends up e-commerce. It's a business decision. Mm. Is, and therefore, is it, are your business going to move away from just media? You're going to start being hooking into stock control? And <laughs> no. Well, it goes deeper and deeper into the yeah. back end of the corporation. But you know, something that people don't give much airtime is independent agencies using uh, the tools as well. Um, so yes, you know, brands, there are some brands doing this, they're, you know, digital first, um, you know, aggressive competitors in that, but we see a really uh, robust reception for, in, you know, the independent and independent-minded agencies adopting the tool to run their business on a DSP because, frankly, they have to innovate, right? You're not part of a giant uh, conglomerate, you don't have the benefits, nor do you have the legacy um, ways of working that sort of inhibit, I think, the, the evolution of, of, the, um, of the AOR model around programmatic. So I'd say stay tuned for more innovation from the small agencies like BSSP in Sausalito, California. It's a transparent trading desk. You pay us a fee and we'll make your results better. You know, fully disclosed, um, they make more money, 
their clients get better results. What's wrong with that? Yeah, it, I, 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 let me, I, I would also say that I, mean, I think the MasterCard client said it really effectively in the, in the breakout session, which is the agency groups potentially need to sort of step away from owning everything and start to orchestrate things uh, a little more effectively. And I think that's, that's, I mean, we have a long way to go is the reality. And we, we reference it as the technology tax and the clutter in the middle. I think, you know, you've got, you got uh, I was reading the other, you've got sharks in Australia tweeting, right? Like that's the innovation that we're driving on a technical scale, yet the lion's share of media today is still executed on an IO basis. And that's, that is the agency that's, that's, okay. that's, that's okay. I'm going to ask the advocating for that. I'm going to ask the awkward question here. So let's talk about the T word, okay? Transparency or trust. What is the issue? Bearing in mind that there's another side. You know, agencies are quite to go, look, we're beating up every which way. Um, I've invested all this technology. I'm giving you a return in my business. There's lots of lots. So I'm not, you know, there's no agency up here to be fair. So yeah. just what, I, it, what it, given that everybody's talking true. about it, it's all over the papers. Yeah. What is the nub of the issue from well, your perspective? Well, let's talk about it. Transparency, you know, AdAge reported that Unilever and P&G wouldn't sign up to the agency's trading desk. And I think, I think it's just based, and, and we heard from Dominic in terms of Zaxxas, and I think it's just transparency knowing what, you know, full disclosure on, on how margin works and prices. So this is the referee and the player? Yeah, I think that's, that's a challenge. So some big clients moved away, that got in the press, and there's all this storm that we're dealing with. So how, I, where are we, and this is just going to carry bubbly on, or is it going to start to tip and become an issue? What, what, what do we... You know, my, my own prediction is, as this uh, stuff becomes less of sort of a black box or black art with the specialists like ourselves, it uh, just becomes more normalized, just like everything does in media, and it becomes another skill set. So, you know, somebody asked me, you know, um, paid search, right? If you, whether you use, you know, Kenshu or Marin or Efficient Frontier or Adobe, you know, were agencies ever managing those platforms and sort of margining up the cost of a, of a, of a click? No, not really. It, 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 it was um, born as a sort of transparent um, technology tool that helped, you know, enable a practice where you charged ser fees for services. So the question is, why would this be any different? And, you know, the cynical answer is, well, because there's been shenanigans happening with media and transparency since, you know, the dawn of time. But um, I would challenge the industry to sort of like, you know, sort of think different. Yeah. This is what we're chatting about before, the, the dangers we have a massive transparency rail for the next year and a bit, and in the meantime, five years out, and everybody uses an excuse to not do anything, as opposed to how do I want to manage every side of the fence. So there's panels now setting up in America, advertisers, clients, to try and get this. But it's, it's such a transformation, as Steve King, you know, we're in such a growing industry, and I think it's a challenge because of that transformation, and everyone's trying to figure out where they create value. <coughs> And you know, we heard from, from MasterCard earlier that they, they want a referee, but they just want the transparency and clarity in what they do, and they need that more than ever right now okay. because right. of this transformation. Conscious of time, yeah. um, one, one answer, one phrase to this. So imagine we're here three to five years' time talking about this whole area. What will we see in three to five years' time? What will be the reality of programmatic or what's we going on? Yeah, go. I mean, I would say, look, I would say we won't be talking about programmatic, we'll be talking about advertising and solutions. I think anything that can get automated will get automated. I think there's a, there's a, obviously, I drive towards efficiency is key. That doesn't mean that there isn't a place for humans and creativity and, and the, opp the opportunity to, uh, to come up with great ideation and integrations. But I would say that with this, this subject will be well behind us. That automation will okay. be in full effect. Brandon? Yeah, I would add to that, it's, I mean, we see it now, but it will be a mobile world completely. So we'll have a proliferation of devices, but the device won't matter because you'll be able to understand people in the right context. Okay. And we'll be talking about a $200 billion market where the media is transacted the way buyers and sellers Mike's want to transact. On that one. Yeah, like that. Right. Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 would, I would say um, I see a world where um, we talk less about planning and buying of media and distribution of message and more about analytics. And I, I'd love it to see that agencies get paid for analytics and insights, which is, you know, I think one of the things that's holding this industry back. Why can't you get paid for that work? Okay. It shouldn't be a freebie that gets tossed yeah, in with yeah, managing absolutely. media. James? I'm with, I'm with so uh, what Mike on that in terms of, uh, you know, analysts, mathematicians getting in there because you find trends like five o'clock on MSN, it's 80% cheaper and it's going to perform 2,000% better. So you need the me mechanism, the so machine based learning. Ahead, what are we going to be talking about? So what, what are we going to be talking about? I mean, we're going to be talking about a, a programmatic world. I mean, programmatic's the same as, as digital media always has been, from ad serving <coughs> networks to programmatic. It's just digital media. And we're going to be in a great business, I think, because there's a lot of spend going towards that. 
where we are. Brilliant. Can you say, please say thank you to my panel. I was trying to finish strong. I don't know if I finished strong. Right. Do remember, we have a speaker's part, so if you want to ch grab and chat to any of these guys, please, anybody, agencies, clients, networks, please do. Thank you very much, gentlemen, um, and thank you very much to Mark Palmer for moderating. Very interesting discussion, huh? Very good. Don't we agree? Yes, come on. <laughs>